Jeffrey. Oh, what, Gazina? Did you hear the rumor about butter? The rumor about butter? No. You know what? I really shouldn't spread it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. How you doing? Better now. Yay! <laughs> We're here for episode eight. Number eight. Imagine that, huh? Pretty soon I'm gonna have a ponytail to rival yours. Your hair has not looked like it's, it's not unruly. You know Ray cut his own hair? Hmm. It was an hmm. adventure. There's still a little hole in his head. <laughs> <laughs> so, but something really wonderful happened today. I know it made me weepy. I saw these kids lined up distance with their parents. So there's a park across the way. And I was like, what's going on? And it was a parade of teachers and they were honking they had really fun signs because and they said we miss you and i got oh it was so That's lovely yeah. and it made me so happy that i got to see it i sweet? miss it the first thing was a big school bus that was like coming by going wah, wah, wah. oh great mm. That's wonderful made me so happy so what are you doing today today i'm making inverse puff Whee! which you'll see in inverse because usually you have the dough on the outside and you will be making uh, deli rye bread. It is so good. So we're going to do something a little differently. I'm going to start with a butter block first because it needs to chill. And I'll talk to you about what the butter block is. It's more like a weird pasty butter dough. And I have it right here. What I did is I mixed relatively cold European butter. I use Vermont Creamery butter. It's 86% butter fat and along with cake flour. Um, and what that does is it creates a paste and then I try to get it as evenly as I can onto some parchment and this is a full sheet of parchment but you can use two halves and tape it along the seam and then I fold it you can see where the folds are to create a little packet that is 8 by 12 inches like that it's not gonna be perfect I can always use tools to make a perfect after and now I'm going to seal it in, and I've, I found out that the only tape that actually works for this is gaffer's tape. So we have to go to Hollywood? Or you don't use any tape at all, otherwise you can just fold it over and then flip it over onto, I'm still going to be using plastic wrap to contain it. So once that is done, I want this to be a very even block. I want it to be even in depth and even in shape. So 8 by 12 is what I'm going for, and because I have to roll it out, I like having a secure packet so that I don't have, I'm not wrangling butter squeezing out the sides. Mm. Um, and so then I do it this way, I do it this way again. However much saran I need. I think that's the hardest part is wrangling. And when I ever have classes, I always tell the students to bring the saran no. wrap to them because if they start walking oh, yeah, with it, it. it, they're tangled yeah. in it by the end. Always the hardest part of class. So, Serangling. Serangling. I like it. So now I flip it over and you can see those little nubbins sticking out. And then I grab my pen and the first thing I do is I go to the corners. And if you want to follow along with the recipe in the description of the video, you just click on that link. And this is, should be the second link for the inverse puff. And the first thing I'm doing is making that butter block. So I make sure, and you can, you can see it, if you look close enough, you can see when the butter has hit the edges. And it won't be even straight away, but I just want to make sure I get to the edges first. And now I will take, I feel to make sure that it's even and it's not. So I'll just go over a few times. I'll go over this way. You can see how containing it, well I can see some spaces where it didn't fill in, so I'm going to go, mm -hmm -hmm. Isn't that a nice packet? And then before, I need to put this in the refrigerator for about 20 minutes, but I like just to square off the edges mm. because I'm a nincompoop and anal retentive. And that's super important so that your results are nice and even. If you're sloppy with the butter, you're we're already going in the wrong direction, aren't you? Absolutely. So the temperature and the shape and the rolling out of everything. So in professional pastry shops, they have a sheeter, which makes everything perfectly um, shaped, perfect depth, mm -hmm. all the layers are perfect. So when you're doing this at home, taking these little steps are really um, important. And also, many uh, patisseries, their butter block already comes prepackaged. Sure, you combine so it from So it's this France. perfect weight. Yep. It's already plastic. And 
And that's a description of the butter that can be very confusing to people who are starting. You want the butter to be plastic and that has to be malleable but still hold mm -hmm. its shape. Cold pliable. Cold pliable. And it's that higher fat European butter that really is gorgeous. It is, even when it's relatively cold, it is still relatively pliable. Most people probably don't have access to that, but 82% butter should be available most anywhere, don't yes. you think? So American butter, you can use. Uh, that's there, 80, right? That's 80. Yeah. Some of them are 82. It's really, some of them claim to be higher fat. But now you can find more and more grocery stores are carrying Finlandia, yep. they're carrying Plu Bra. Right, uh, Cabot 83. Cabot, yes, if you can find that. I love Vermont Creamery the most. It's it's just a gorgeous butter and it's 86% yeah. and it's just that beautiful almost orange hue. Mm -hmm. uh, it's my favorite all-time butter. And it's worth noting that any butter you use in pastry should be unsalted. Unsalted, yes, unsalted butter. <clears throat> unsalted. Again, my theory, the only people who use salted butter in baking are tipsy when they do it. <laughs> True story. So I'm going to put this in the refrigerator. It needs to be in there about 20 minutes. So in the meantime, Jeffrey's going to be doing yeah, some fun stuff with rye. Very nicely risen deli rye here. If you've had a chance to look at the formula, you'll see that it's 20% whole rye flour, 80% white flour. So you might call it an entry level rye bread. It's not a big robust rye. It's very tasty but it's pretty, pretty basic rye bread. I'm very fond of this for a lot of reasons. I like the light texture of it. I also am somebody who likes caraway seeds, and there's only, I think, 0.75% or something in this formula. If you don't like caraway seeds, you can certainly omit them. So I'm gonna divide these, pre-shape them, then I'm gonna load some bread that I made about an hour ago, I shaped it, So these are going to be 680 grams, which is the same as a pound and a half. And did you mention that this is a double recipe? Yeah, I guess the one that's posted is half this size it, yeah, because it's, it's it won't less. fit. Yeah. But this way you can see more shaping. Actually, I'm going to make two loaves, not three. I'm going to make a big double. So this is a three Ooh. pound loaf. Are you going to bake that on um, a stone? You can bake it on a stone with steam, or you can bake it um, in a cast iron, in which case you won't need steam. And you found that fantastic cast iron. Yes, that's a wonderful. It's like a camping cast iron that is long enough to hold, would hold that loaf. These are going to be little salt sticks, which I'm also very fond of. And I'm scaling these to just over 100 grams, so a little less than four ounces. And you are pre-shaping first. Yep. Then we're going to load bread. Oh, yeah, that's right, the kettle. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I have to get some water nice and hot so that we can create steam in the oven. Oh, when I was a kid, I... You know, it's interesting. I've worked a couple times in German bakeries, and the Germans have all these magnificent seed blends that go on yes. top of a loaf, but you would never ever see whole caraway seed inside a loaf. Inside a loaf. Or, and I, where I had it the most as a child was in um, sauerkraut. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so these will rest, and as they do, We'll load the bread that was shaped about 50 minutes ago, as soon as that kettle comes up. But I'll show it to you so you can see what state it's in. Jeffrey, where do you get your proofing bags? These? Yeah. Uh, I can't remember where I got these. Um, these are actually trash liners, which sounds pretty scary if you think it about it. To me. No, but I'm they're food grade. That's been verified by the Vermont Health Department. If you see those black contractor bags, like at uh, hardware stores yeah. that smell, those you don't want to use. Okay, but, but, but can use liners? Pan liners? Can liners? Can li what are can Trash liners? Can liners? If they're clear and I mean I would check yeah. it with whatever department. Well that's good to know because you can if you can find the right brand, the right type. There are some uh, that I would not recommend that have Febreze in them. 
Oh, forget no, it. No, good riddance. Okay, here we have. Wow, oh, those are beautiful. These are definitely risen. So what are you feeling for? I'm feeling like we talked about, I think it was last week, we're trying to ascertain the inner condition by palpating the exterior of the loaf and trying to get a sense of the inner lightness. If this becomes one of the challenging parts to ascertain really when it's ready for new bakers, you just have to keep in mind that if you dedicate yourself to focusing on everything from the time you scale out your ingredients, gradually you'll build up a body of data and you'll learn all the different aspects of the, of the bread making process. It doesn't come right off the bat, but if I said to myself, okay, I think these are right, I think they're proofed well, and then I cut them and then they come out of the oven and they've ripped all along the bottom, that's an indication that they were under-risen so they're kind of bursting irregularly. If they come out of the oven and they're completely flat, that's an indication that either they were shaped poorly, they weren't fermented properly, they weren't mixed properly, or they were over-risen. So we have to try to be attentive at every stage so that we can build that body of knowledge. As I've said often to students, <clears throat> there is a language of bread and it's attainable, uh, and people think that's all kinds of hokey stuff, but we have a cat at home, and that's not the same species as Homo sapiens. And yet, I'm pretty fluent in cat language. I know when the cat's hungry, tired, angry, whatever. Bread's the same way. It's, got, it's telling you something all the time, and one of the joyous jobs is coming to understand what it's saying. So, that's just about boiling, right? Kajina? Yeah, it is. You want me to put it in now? Not quite. You know okay. what? Could I ask you to pull out the cast iron? Yes. Let's see. This one will put like this. It's going to leave a mark. Oh, I'm sorry. Hey, I've got marks all over this table. Is this heat safe? Yes, because I say it is. Okay. <laughs> Good. So that's going to go for the small one. So I'm going to slice these. When I have a loaf that's seeded, I find it's preferable to use a serrated knife. Oh, that's nice. You don't need a fancy lamb. No. Try to be symmetrical in terms of the spacing and the depth. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. We're happy. That's happy enough, I guess. And then this one. Is the steam ready now? Yes, it is. I'll All put it in. Right. Well, it is now. And these are going in at 216. Let me do this first so that I okay. don't get a steam burn. Thanks. Oh, we also have the little, do you want to do a little spritz? Or oh, not? yeah, yeah, with that gizmo that you have. I've never seen one of these. That's a mister. This is a um, mister that is traditionally used with hair care so that it literally, and Evian bottles, you can get that Evian mister. Can you We're, get a Miz or just a mister? Just a mister. No Miz, unfortunately. Just checking, just checking, okay. That's the mister. Here, want me to do a little spritz so you can see? The mist? I don't want to do it at the lens. So you can see the droplets, it's like really fine particulate. So it doesn't just Kind of like coronavirus? <laughs> That's what I was thinking too. I was not going to go there. So what is next? Is shaping next? Let's see if they're relaxed enough. These don't need too much time to relax. Well, you've got an awful lot that you're doing today. So these oh are a little young, and I shouldn't shape them yet, but I'm going to do it simply so that we can devote a lot more time to what yeah, you're doing. Yeah, because my butter is not cool okay. enough. It's, it's not cold enough. It's not cold enough. Not this one. Okay. I'm so happy that you scored with a serrated knife. Again, I, I like to do that with, um, with seeded breads. And why, is there something about the serration that makes it easier to cut through? It's got more bulk to it. Yeah. Uh, alarm, it's a little too kind of flimsy, plus you'll yes. dull it very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. 
And we don't need this again, so we can go here. All right, so this is the three pounder. One thing that's quite important is always making sure that your hands don't stick to the loaf and the loaf doesn't stick to the bench. If your hand sticks to the loaf, the chances are you're going to rip it. And since that's the visual part, it's going to be somewhat of a defect. So as you're, as you're shaping, if there's the slightest bit of tackiness, all you have to do is, that's it. Just a quick running your hands. There's usually plenty of residual flour on the, on the bench. If not, just dip your hands in flour. All right, if you want caraway seeds, what you do is put the seams up. This is a damp cloth. Roll it into a bed of seeds and put it here. Nice. Now we can do it with Junior. So a little flour here so that the dough doesn't stick to the bench, but not too much or it'll just slide. If I had this amount of flour, it would definitely be too much. So another thing to keep in mind is that there are many, many ways to shape loaves, oval loaves, round loaves, baguettes. There's all kinds of ways to do it. So this is a way that I like. I like the way it feels on my hands and I like the fact that it's quick. Um, but if you have another method that you like that works, by all means, keep doing that. Or say, well, I saw the different shaping that Hamilton did. Maybe I'll try that and see if it's easier. One thing about breads like this is you probably don't want to have pointy ends. This wouldn't really be the proper bread for that. A, a white bread or a baguette or something, that's one thing. But I wouldn't do that with these breads. I grew up for part of my upbringing outside New York City. And I'm old enough to remember the days when there really was still good bread. Oh, you know what we didn't put in? Salt sticks. We'll do that right now. Oh, let's. We're going to load the salt sticks. These are little rolls, the same as these here. And they won't get the full benefit of the steam, but we're going to put them in now anyway. I can spritz them. OK, spritz away. I'll spritz them. Here you go, mister. I'll miss them, mister away. And those were in at 20, so 16 oh. after for the one, and then 20 Would for the Would you like a timer? Uh, sure. How about 16 minutes? 16, you got it. We're at 480 Fahrenheit. In the home oven, I would highly recommend starting at the highest and then lowering if you yeah. need be. The main reason is there's a lot more mass in here. So even though similar to a home oven, when you open this, you're letting a lot of mm -hmm. heat potentially leave. This is a much more robust oven and so you're not going to lose as much. But in a home oven, start at 500, 525 and then you might want to lower it because when you first put stuff in, you're going to lose 50 degrees just opening the door. Also, if, you're, if you end up baking with one of those cast iron things, it is so heavy and can be very cumbersome that you have the oven open longer than you intended. These are salt sticks, but if, if you'd like to have the act, actual perfect German pronunciation, it's Salzstangerl. How's that sound? Huh? <laughs> Salzstangerl. <laughs> so it's the same dough, right. obviously. Salzstangerl. That's he, just what I said. Yeah, it's exactly what you said. You know, the only word that really um, uh, confounds me that uh, is usually pronounced incorrectly is Spätzle. People say sh Spätzle. Spätzle. They say Spätzle, uh -huh. and it dries me So bad. say the correct way. Spätzle. Spätzle? Spätzle. It's L-E, not E-L. Uh-huh, Spätzle. Spätzle. I love Spätzle. They're my favorite. We had E-R-L is a diminutive, right? Yes, it's like, yes. Because I know Mozart was called Wolf, Wolferl by yeah, his wife. Yeah, Wolferl. It's also, I believe, a, a, a more, that would be Austrian, but it, to me, I grew up in, you know, with the Bavarian. That happens a lot. What happens a lot? The ERL? The ERL. Yeah. yeah. It's an affectionate diminutive, right? It is. Right? Yeah. It is. So what's in here is caraway with coarse salt. You want to show that, Ray, if you could get up close? 
it's, I didn't weigh it out, I just kind of eyeballed it, but you want to have a you know, reasonable sprinkling of the salt, and that, that's a really tasty thing. And I'm, it's very important that later I show you how to cut these salt sticks so that you don't mangle your fingers. Well, it's part of the flavor. Do you want to get your I will get my stuff now? Okay. Butter. Cute little rolls. Really, really good with cream cheese. Okay, inverse. We're inversing. So we're off to the land of puff, and specifically inverse puff, where the butter goes on the outside. It's magical. And you might wonder why bother if there's another way to do puff that doesn't seem as complicated or that is potentially so messy, and it's not. Um, it's because inverse puff, when you do this almost uh, paste-like uh, butter block, it is so much lighter. It has a much better um, mouthfeel. And specifically for things like Napoleon, where you have to cut through multiple layers, the cutting is really easy. It just bursts apart. It's so flaky. So you don't want to have to saw through it. This is, it makes things just so light and flaky and delicious um, and delicate comparatively. Well, one thing I'm sure is happening is that since a fair bit of flour is being mixed in with the butter, that flour can't develop any glutinous properties. And it's, I use cake flour. I use unbleached cake flour as well, which is lower in protein anyway. Just in here? Or Just in here. Yeah. And then I use uh, all unbleached all-purpose all yeah. for this one. And I'm, so the other thing about this is the dough that I made and the recipe, if you go into the description, it, you can follow along. The dough, when you make it, you have to be careful that you don't overwork it. I only do it on about medium once it just comes together for about three minutes. You do not want a completely developed dough because you're going to continue developing it as you roll it out and as you do the folds. So it'll get too tough if you overwork it. So it should look uh, a little unattractive. It should be coming together, but it shouldn't be um, one of those lovely doughs that is shiny, which it couldn't be anyway. But so here is my butter block. Here is my dough that has, it's a, about the same temperature as the butter block now, if it would only just come out neatly. And I'm going to, I formed it so that it was about half the measure of the butter block. And make sure that you, see, bendy, that's nice. You get together. And now I'm going to do the lock-in. And that literally means I'm going to lock that dough in. It's nice and cool. Sometimes you have to wrangle that dough so that it stays in. Because it's I've a fair I've always found that if you make inverse puff pastry, you can get the cheapest kind of fork plastic fork at a gas station and, convenience and, and store and, and it's fork tender. It is fork tender and that is what, why people, why bother? It's because especially when you're doing something that requires some, uh, you know, some work, like a Napoleon would be the perfect example. You don't want it to be completely sawable, right? You don't want to have to saw through the thing to get a good bite full. So I'm going to do a little dusting again, a little more on top. And now I'm going to do my roll out, sometimes a, a nice air bubble, it just burped. And I also made sure, because I put hot stuff down right here, <laughs> that I wasn't rolling on the hot stuff, because mm. you know what happens with butter. And this is not as cold as I would really like it to be, but you can still see, even when it's still a little warm, that, want to get that in there, that is still rolling okay and that it is not sticking to my pen because I've got a, a decent amount of flour down. And I want to get this to about 10 by 16. And then I'll do a fold. And every once in a while I lift it up just to make sure that it is not sticking. And I'm also keeping an eye out for any errant caraway seeds <laughs> that may have traveled <laughs> into the land of puff. So let's do a quick or eyebrow hairs. So let's see, well here we are, 
Almost there. We've got nine minutes on that timer. And isn't it interesting how it is almost like a dough, that butter. So I'm going to just shore this up. You know, I didn't get myself. I didn't get myself a bench scraper, which would be very helpful. Then you get one. And so now I'll get a bench scraper. And I'm feeling it's sticking a little because it was not cold enough to begin with. So I'll just do the one turn and I'll show you what that is. So I'll fold it. It's called a letter fold. So I'm going to fold it like, literally like a letter. If you are very young, you likely do not know what that looks like. That is what it looks like. So I'm going to stay. See a little of that dough sticking out, but don't worry. A little messy. Could I've done better. Could you put that one in and, and have that on the inside? I could. Do it this way. Oh. Pretend it never happened. No, I'll do it this way. Watch. Flip it over, right? It never happened. Yeah. There we go. Oh, a lot of butter. Because it is a little warm right now, usually I would do two turns and folds in a row, but I'm gonna get this into the refrigerator for a little bit. And then I want to show you what this looks like when it has come out of the oven. Are you gonna do another fold on this during this session? Yeah, I can. Okay, because I think it's also worth pointing out the reason it's called a, this a half book fold is because it's kind of like a book, open end, open end, open end, and then the spine of the book. I'll also, what I can also do is I can show a book fold and not actually complete it. Yeah. Because it is so nice just to know the language. Yeah. That if you yeah. are reading recipes and you don't understand it. So this would be a single fold. I call it a letter fold because it looks like a letter, a business letter. But I think if you're a young and you've never, you've only done email, you wouldn't know what that means. Well, the French have one term, tour simple. Here it can be letter fold, half book fold, yeah. three fold, single fold. So it can be pretty confusing. It can be very confusing. So that's going back in the fridge, and then I will show you it baked off. Everything's working great. Right? One thing you can do too, if it's really hot, it's summertime and you decide you want to make a beautiful fresh fruit tart using the inverse puff pastry, you could put water on a sheet pan, freeze it, and then yes. roll out the puff pastry on another sheet pan that's sitting on top of the frozen one so that you've got a cold environment. I will freeze a uh, little, I have a little thing, this right here, this marble, I'll put it in the freezer yeah. as if well. If you have a marble, that's perfect. And it has to be small enough because it can get very heavy and take up so much room. So let's look at what the difference is between a weighted puff and a not weighted puff. When you're making Napoleon or Palmier, what you do is I take about a pound of the puff. Um, it's a little more than a quarter of what we're making. And then I roll it out to about an eighth of an inch. And it's gonna be smaller than the size of a sheet pan. I let it rest for at least 20 minutes, longer in the fridge if I can. Then you dock it, which means you poke holes in it, and then you weigh it down. I'll put another piece of parchment on top, another sheet pan, and today, because this stinker is like, yeah, it is so puffy. It will. I had a weight on top of it, and I I looked in there, and it was just lifting the weight like mm -hmm. it was Arnold Schwarzenegger, wow. just going raw. So today I put two of these, wow, two of these on top, weighing down that sheet pan that was upside down just to keep it weighted down. And you're like, well, what's the point of that when the whole name is puff? Don't you want to puff? It will still flake. But if you think about building a Napoleon, I'm sure you have it in your mind, or Mille Foy, uh, you want to have flat layers. And if it just went mm -hmm. on its own volition, it would be impossible to Are build. Are you doing three layer Napoleon? I'm just doing two. Two layer, okay, two typically layers. it's three. And if you had three of this thick thickness, oh, you, that would be a little no. hard to get your mouth around. Well, but it's also, the other thing that's very important, which uh, is kind of typical of American pastry, is that a lot of Americans would look at this and think this has been flavored with cocoa. Wow. Because it's so dark. But that it's is- called butter, 86% butter. Yeah, and it's also time. So you want to make sure you get the flavor out of it and that you get it baked all the way through. That color is a wonderful thing. It says that it's got this gorgeous flavor and that it has baked all the way through and that it will shatter when you put your fork through it. But it's way, and you can see my little docking holes. 
So you dock it so that it also impedes that uneven rise. Now on the other hand, and this is what this looks like, uh, you can see these sides, I didn't trim them before I put it in because I trim them after I bake. Here is the puff that hasn't been impeded and it was rolled out to the same depth as mm -hmm. the, um, the weighted one. Yeah. And so you can see how much it does rise and one of my favorite fillings for this, and you're gonna see sweet when I do the Napoleon, and savory is here, and that's just like a, I make my own pimento cheese, mm -hmm. and I just shoved a bunch of pimento cheese in there. And what do you call this product? I call it yummy. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a, like a, you know, it's a giant vol au vin. So yeah. I essentially, so you can see, I made little guidelines in there. I did not cut all the way to the bottom for this. And then you gently take out this little guy in the middle, and then I always save it for a little topper, so it and has a hat. And you do that when it's cold though, right? You, you do that do when that it's, yes. Temperature. You have to make sure that it is cold. And you ha also have to make sure that it is baked through so that the bottom is also dark and not blonde so that you know that when you eat it, that there's nothing. There's gotta be crumbs everywhere. There, you good. have to be looking terrible. Please eat this on a train where everyone can see you just full <laughs> of stuff, please. So that's that and we'll, do you have something that you would like to go do while I wait for my uh, butter to chill? Yeah, a, a terminology question, yes. and I might have this backwards or wrong. My understanding was if this is sweet, it's a vol and if it's in this shape with a savory, it's a boucher. Oh, I did see, I always called any, when I do this, I call it a vol Uh-huh. I just, I just use it for everything, so boucher for the savory? I think, I think that's true. I, ah. I'm not sure. It's worth looking into. It will. And vol means light as the wind. Light as the wind, right, because it, obviously it goes up. Whoa. Yeah. And Neofoy means thousand sheets, thousand sheets, because if you make classic French puff pastry with six letter folds, you've got over 1,400 yes. layers. And my, this does not, but I'm happy with it. But yes, Neofoy, I thought it was leaves. I thought foy was leaves. Yeah, leaves, leaves sheets, yeah. <laughs> We're getting there. Here, you need this one? Here. Oh, they're a little young. And they didn't get, you can see how the steam was not good. Here you can see a really nice lift on the bottoms, which is a good sign. If they were overrisen, they wouldn't lift that way. Or yeah. if the oven weren't hot enough, they wouldn't lift that way either. They're not done. You can see just how pale Very it is. Very pale. So it's got a ways to go. We'll turn it around and let it finish. What would you think? So we have a minute left on the timer. A minute what would you for like? the salt sticks? Yeah. I think a little more, yes? Yeah, give it five, Okay, please. about five minutes. <clears throat> and are you gonna mix some dough? Um, I can do that now if that's better for your work. But I can also, I can, I can assemble some of these guys. You want to do that? Let's do that. Let's assemble some of these guys. So by you want to do that here and I can clean up your station? Oh, that's okay. That's okay? Okay. I like working on a dirty station. I, I was only kidding anyway. I wouldn't do that for you. <laughs> that's cruel and unusual. So, um... You put I, salt in here? Yes. There is salt. Yeah. So... I have some pastry cream that I lightened with some whipped cream. So creme légère doesn't have any gelatin in it. So that I can pipe it, it will stay still. And I will show you how to make it next week because I'm going to do a, a slight continuation of this. I'm going to make choux hmm. next week. Hmm. So I'm going to do little uh, cochettes, choquettes, choquettes, yep. choquettes with the, the sugar on top. And then I'll also do a Saint Honoré. Oh, neat. So we'll be using some of this next week and learning something new. But you're using the Saint Honoré tip today, yes, too. Yes, but here I'm going to be... For the finish, right? Yeah, so this is just... I do little dollops in here. Just a... Get in there. You know, there's something so irresistible about a Napoleon, and it's just the most basic things. I mean, not basic in terms of technical expertise required, but in terms of the number of components. Yes, and you can, I'm using um, maple. This is maple pastry cream. Mm. With, what's that? Um, creme légère because it's got the whipped cream in That's it. That's beautiful. But it, I used maple sugar instead of granulated sugar. And it is so lovely and just gentle on top. And then I will 
use my St. Honoré tip, and I'd like you to see what it looks like before I start piping. Did you know that was the first piping tip invented? Really, was it? Yeah, because... And it's the hardest to find now. <laughs> um, yeah, because prior to that, they just made a lot of canals, and this was meant to ah. mimic canals. How beautiful. Oh, Gazina, that's so elegant. And then I made a little sugar, caramelized sugar, and then you can just put little, oh. little dollops on top. Let go. And what I love is that obviously as the sugar is in your pot, if you don't put it in ice water, if you start off with it relatively light, by the time you are finished, it's going to be a little darker. And I love it when I decorate things with different shades of caramel. Mm. It reminds me of my dog Ruthie, who she herself is different shades mm. of caramel. I don't know if I'm coming back after this week because you're really outclassing me. No, this is one of my favorite things to do. And pi I just love piping. I like piping so mm. much. And we have two because we should. And then you can see too how much easier that would be uh, rather than having just letting it go crazy and puff up, or as I call it, jazz hands, in the oven, that it is so much more layerable. And I could continue. I could add another layer if I wanted to. But I like that um, St. Honoré squiggles so much that I think it would be a little, as my father would have said, gilding the lily, had I done yet one more layer on top. And the uh, pastry cream I will be showing you how to make next week. And in case you want to get ingredients, I'm just going to be doing it with maple sugar. But you can use the same amount of granulated sugar because I'm sure, unless you're living in Vermont or New Hampshire or upstate New York, getting maple sugar probably isn't the easiest thing in the world, right? So you can just use granulated sugar. And for people that want to make a St. Honoré tube, you can just take a round tube and a tin snips and cut that V. Go to your local hardware store and get yourself some tin snips. Yeah. Yeah. That's, That's a great what I idea. did when I, when I couldn't find one. You make your own. And I have a favorite, uh, ooh, you go, come with me. I have a favorite St. Honoré tip. It is this one that has the gentle slope. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is a much yeah, more elegant. Yeah. I don't like those squared off ones. I don't no. like them squared off. No. So that was our... I just pulled that. Yep, yeah, thanks. It's funny that when you get, you have your favorite tools. This is one of my favorite piping tips, but it has to be that one. Yeah. Oh, and I've got a knife at home that only is used to score Pativier. That's all it does. Oh. It doesn't do anything else in life except that. But when, as William Blake said, tools are made, but born were hands. But you need, you need your tools. You do need your tools. And there we go. We have Los That is so Honoré's. beautiful. And I like how the caramel kind of mimics the, the color of the puff pastry, too. I do, too. And uh, my recommendation is when you do this, you can refrigerate this for a bit, but only for a bit, because you want to eat this while it's still very flaky. If it's, flaky. If it's under refrigeration for too long, the humidity the moisture will get to the flakes. And also, if you're going to put something like this on top, that those little caramel dots, they will start getting nice and yeah, um, yeah. goopy. Gazina, please, where are those pot holders? Right oh, here. Good. I stole them. I want to look at that cast iron jobby. And I also wanted to show you, I made this same inverse puff with cocoa. So what I did is I just took 10 grams of the flour out and replaced it with a Dutch cocoa, in this case a black cocoa. And you've got to get really close. But if you can get really close, like really close, you can st see those layers a little more effectively when you have the cocoa. Can you see them? Right there. And there's some, what I find really interesting is that when I'm making traditional puff, when the um, dough's on the outside, that butter layer is so much more obvious when you cut into it but in this case it is so much more subtle but everything is much more even and the flake is so much more delicate it is my favorite 
So if you did want to use uh, cocoa, what you would do is you would use a Dutch cocoa. I used, in this case, black cocoa that you can get at King Arthur or Kayabo, the black cocoa really just that, it's not a lot, it's 10 grams, but it gives enough flavor and color to this that you can see that beautiful cocoa color and you get that cocoa flavor. So 10 grams from the flour, and then you replace that 10 grams that you've taken out of flour with 10 grams of the Dutch cocoa. And these here are palmier. So what I did is I, rolled out the puff in sugar and I shaped it and there are lots of tutorials how to do palmier. This is the, the, the palm leaf shape but you can make it um, just curl it into each other so it has these, it looks like a little heart. And this is also weighted so when you bake this I just put the sheet pan on top with a little parchment and weigh it down that way and I bake it for at 375 for about 10 to 15 minutes and then I take that top off because if you don't it gets so dark in the oven that you're gonna forget something's in there and the next thing you're gonna ask yourself is what's that smell and it's the smell of burning palmier and that's the other thing that I love about these using inverse is that sometimes because this is caramelized sugar it can be like hard on hard if you have a traditional puff that isn't as tender. And so this, the eating of it is so lovely. It is one of those experiences where you should not wear a sweater that has a lot of like, you know, like a chenille something because you won't be able to get those flakes out. So now we're morphing into fashion advice in yes. this program? <laughs> yes, I think it's important. Wear cotton and smooth. Now you're up. Are you gonna make some dough? Yes, I'm gonna make some dough. Uh, but I think these can come out now. Okay. So the smaller loaf. Yep. This is the one that's self-steamed. And it's quite effective. It's done. We'll get it someplace out of the way so the mark doesn't get too yep. big. I know. <laughs> this is like the scars on my arms. There are scars on this table. But also, the good thing about that is, is like when you first dropped it, it's darker. You know that that is hot, and I would not be rolling anything on top of that. Yeah, big time. So in the, when I was rolling, doing the inverse, I didn't have any ovens on at all. And today's a strangely warm day. So I plan to do this based on the fact that our days have been relatively cool, cooler than normal. And so, of course, today is the hottest day we've had all year. And what do I decide to do? There you go. Inverse puff pastry. It will be so, okay. this is a good comparison. I baked this loaf at home on Wednesday. Um, I try to do a bake during the week just to verify things. And same weight. Um, this one's slightly longer, not too much, but slightly. But you can see a distinct color difference. This did not bake in a cast iron. This baked in my home oven on a baking stone but it's got more of a sheen. This one is more matte, and I think the reason is because when I put a cup of, wa of boiling water into a preheated cast iron, the volume of air in a 30-inch home oven is much less than the volume of mm -hmm. air in here, so the steam didn't dissipate as quickly on this one as it did on this one. So that's why this is more matte, and that's a little richer color interesting anyway so we're going to mix and i think uh we already mentioned that the formula that is listed is half the size of the one that i made right yes because you won't be able to fit a full batch in a home stand mixer so <clears throat> we're going to mix instead in here this is a 20 quart bowl and because we've talked about sourdough a couple of times I decided that I would use part liquid Levan sourdough and part rye sourdough. For these loaves, the one that I brought and the one that just came out of the oven, it's been completely rye sourdough, which to me is preferable to generate a rye bread with rye sourdough. However, in order for people to see ripe sourdough that's both liquid and firm, we're going to use both just this time. So. This was mixed yesterday evening. It's about 16 hours old at this point. You can see it's cracked on the surface. 
that's an indication of ripeness. Um, it's also feeling puffy. This is sourdough that um, I made when I was leaving my first job. So I actually have my notebook at home that, that says that on August 28th, 1980, I started making a sourdough. Very unscientific notes. But it's been making bread ever since. And I think at this point, it's made, I'm sure, a million loaves. It I has really to have. have. Now, if you just had white flour, sourdough, how would you convert that for a single bake of this? A single bake, what I would do is I would, if your preference is to maintain a white sourdough, then what you should do in, lieu, in advance of making the rye bread is keep some of your white sourdough maintained with just white flour. And then measure out the required amount of liquid sourdough, feed it rye for, I usually feed two days. I only keep a rye sourdough, so if I'm going to make a white bread or a whole wheat bread or a non-rye bread, I'll take my rye culture and I'll give it usually two feeds of white flour or wheat or spelt or whatever it is that I'm doing. And that way I've retained my original culture, but I've used some of it to just digest some other flours. It's that mm -hmm. easy. Okay, so there's that. Here's water that I just scaled out. Because I've got the, what, the white sourdough and the rye, I'm going to have to pay very careful attention to the consistency of the dough. I might very well have to add some flour to it. This particular bread has yeast in it. And I have been told by uh, one of the larger yeast manufacturers that if you can't find their instant yeast, um, that you should ask your grocer for them to start carrying the fresh yeast because they can get that much more quickly because it's, it's infinitely more thing. available. Yeah. So go to your grocer and ask them to carry it and apparently they can get it lickety split. Yeah. And that would be carried in the refrigerated aisle. It wouldn't be in the baking aisle. The so, thing you have to keep in mind is that if you do wind up buying fresh yeast, it's much more perishable, just like a yes. loaf of bread is more perishable than a cracker. Right. And that's and why it's And if in it's the at all like second. gummy, then it's lost a lot of its gas and power. So if you're going to buy fresh yeast, break it. It should have a break like a white button mushroom. It should be a nice clean break. It should be a nice tawny color. If there's a little sheen of reddish mold on it, that's not a problem because yeast is a fungus. And sometimes you'll see a little bit of of mold, but don't worry about that. But if it's at all gummy, it's too old. So, so this nice is going to mix gonna... for three minutes on first speed, and then it's going to head to second speed until it's got adequate strength, which is probably going to be three to four minutes. why that's happening I can do another fold good 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 mm. when the dough comes together check it right away for consistency in case you have to add a little bit of moisture or perhaps a little bit of flour um, I also am a firm believer in tasting every dough to make sure that the, not only is the salt in there but it's the correct amount of salt um, Here's Gazina with another fold. That's great. That feels better now. You get over there. So what you do, it, it, they're folds in turn, so the turn literally means that you have folded it. So now you turn it 90 degrees. Aha. And then you roll it out. We're rolling it out to 16 by 10. Get that puppy in there. And you can see where that butter is cracking just a little bit. So what I like to do is I usually like, if the weather permits, I will do two turns, one after the other. This tends to be much more pliable and easier to work with, to my mind, than um, traditional puff. So you can get those turns in relatively quickly. Also, you want to make sure that you're not rolling out in front of a 500 degree oven on the warmest day of the year. 
That would be really helpful. I'm just telling you. Usually my timing in these things is pretty good. This time it was not. Maybe going forward we should, at certain times, we should trade places. That would be great. Today would have been, I should have thought about that. And we now, could have done it Are you going to show a, a full book I fold? will. I will show a full book fold. So just let me get this too. So if you read somewhere that you are to do a, a book fold, a full book fold, this is how you would do it. You would take the one end there, a little less, and the other would come and meet the seam right here. Look how hot this is. This is insane. And then you would fold it over again. That is a book fold. Now I'm just going to keep it there in the book fold because this poor puppy is so warm. Typically, how many folds do you give? Of this, I give four folds of the... Four single folds. Four single exactly. folds or letter folds. Yep. And what I do is I do two folds in a row, refrigerate yep. for an hour, and then do two more folds. Okay, another question I have. Yeah. Um, whenever I make croissant or puff pastry, yes. I always make the day trump, so the dough without the butter, a day ahead. Yes. Do you do that too? Um, this time I did it for this one. Yeah. Um, sometimes I will just give it uh, two hours, but if I am thinking far ahead, yeah. I will do it the night before and have it in the fridge overnight. For a croissant, I always do the detente the yeah. night before. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and have have it ready to rumble. So we're gonna go back in, and let me just tell you, I had this in the freezer. I put this in the freezer, and it was. Nice and warm here. So how long has that been going? This has another one minute on second. Okay, I wish you could see that because it looks super cool. So you can see that the dough is starting to ride up the hook a bit. Yep, and it's got some strength. I don't know if you can see that, Ray. Can you get in there? You can see that it's yeah, not sure. just shredding apart in my hand, but this isn't really getting into the party, so I'm going to pull that down and mix it for another 30 seconds or so. Good idea when you're mixing to just keep one hand clean in case the phone rings or a fly lands on your nose or something. Okay. Whoops. So if a baker makes a sourdough and makes a thousand loaves of sourdough bread a week, I'm talking about a production baker, mm -hmm. which is not that much bread, no. and bakes for 50 weeks a year, that's 50,000 loaves a year. And if that baker bakes for 20 years, he or she has made a million loaves of bread. Yep. Sounds right to me. That's a lot of loaves of bread. You're a millionaire. In bread. I'd rather be a millionaire in bread than in bread. <laughs> there. This dough is fine. So is that developed enough for you? It is developed enough for me. When I go to give it the final shape, if it seems a little bit not strong enough, I'll just be more vigorous in the pre-shaping and in the final shaping too. We can always edit the bread all throughout its trajectory, but now, this feels good. is this a bread that you would give a fold during the... Not necessary, because it's only a one hour bulk. Okay. Right? So it's not really necessary. However, if you're mixing it at home and it doesn't seem like it's attained adequate strength, by all means, give it a fold halfway through. Halfway through. Yeah. And then you would cover this at this point Give it that hour, mm -hmm. and then you would get to the pre-shape. Yep. Shape. And that's a and that's bake. a really that's a pretty quick bread. Well, rye breads in general are very quick because they really won't tolerate a super long fermentation. Right. If the acidity gets too great, then the dough structure starts to break down, which is why a lot of true Germanic style rye breads, like if you have 100% rye 
many times there's no bulk fermentation. The flavor is coming from the sourdough yeah. and the ingredients, and you don't want it to get too acidic uh -huh. or you'll have dough breakdown. Yeah, except for the overnight um, making of the, yeah, yeah. the sourdough. Yeah. That's, that's the one time consumer. Oh, okay. look at that, look at that. Now you can see a little better that it's in the smaller bowl. So, you're going to make pate choux next week. I am. I'm going to make that. And I'm sure, as always, you're going to make a few products, right? I will, yes. Okay. And I was going to make brioche next week, but maybe I'll wait another week. I did it so because you were making brioche. Oh, okay. I was okay. so excited. I'm I was excited. To make brioche. Because I wanted it to be Frenchy Frenchy. And you, okay. want, you were going to use Swedish sugar on something? Swedish pearl sugar. Yes. Yeah. And I was, going to, I was going to put it on the shoquette. So. Okay, good. We're I figure we can throw sugar at each we other. We can do that, okay? And if there's any caraway seeds left, we'll throw some of them, too. <laughs> <laughs> caraway seeds. Thank you for uh, playing yeah. with us. I yep. had a great time. Yeah, fun as always. Keep so well, we're going to be flaky baking. and dirty by the end of this. <laughs> so we'll see you next week, 2 o'clock, same bat channel, same bat time.